Turnaround Tuesday, everybody. Giles, looking forward to having a conversation with you. Hi, Kevin. Sinatra Forex Scale saying that um, Loba Media websites were shut down. <clears throat> okay. Was it a hack? Currencies are pretty quiet here. Good morning, Marco. Okay. So we have a little pullback in Euro here. Still pretty orderly. Still think this low should hold. Um, Aussie not pulling back as much. Still waiting for a deeper pullback to go for it. Okay. And I was looking at the end. And what's missing here, guys? You know, I got a tweet yesterday from someone who uh, showed me my favorite chart pattern. You guys see anything missing here? Not saying it, it's going to happen because yields are really dropping. In fact, you know, we're really, yeah. So that has me hesitating here. So yields uh, coming off, we're only about six bips from a breakdown at this green line, which I think should fuel some things. I don't think it's because of a uh, flight to quality yet because uh, we're knocking on the door of new contract highs, new all-time highs in the S&Ps. We're about ha eight handles away. And NASDAQ's even a bit stronger today. And you guys know what I'm waiting for here. I remember back here when we came off, said, you know, this could just be the second drive. And, you know, here we are. So I'm thinking 14.3, 14.4 um, new highs, especially if the S&Ps are going to attack the 4,300 handle. They keep buying the dips in gold. I mean, you can't rule out, you know, ABC back to the line here and silver is still acting weaker than gold. But pretty orderly, doesn't it look a lot like the Euro? Look at this formation right here, the way it's advanced and look at Euro. So, I mean, that's as close to um, an identical chart pattern as I could come up with. And if I'm looking for one more high in Euro, and I believe we have ECB today, and what I mean by one more high is besides taking out the stops here, okay. Hey, Dale, just so I want to let you know, ECB is actually tomorrow, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's All actually right. Thursday. Actually, I take that back. Oh, Wait. well. Yeah, okay. Thursday. Thursday. So you got two days to trade the euro. Yeah, and then tomorrow's the Bank of Canada. Sorry, I'm just I'm getting my head back in the game, too. Since hey, where, I, where were you? Look beautiful up there. Were you in Prescott or? Uh, no, I was in northern Arizona. Um, I, I'll let you continue, but I'll just tell you real quick. My, my son had a... Um, he had a soccer camp and um, oh. it, it's because of COVID um, these overnight soccer camps. And you guys could probably imagine like the university said, no, you can't use the dorms because of COVID. So, Oh, you're in flag. So I went to Flagstaff to Northern oh, okay. Arizona university. Yeah. And um, so the kids still wanted to go to this camp. So what we had to do is we had to rent a, a, a home or a cabin yeah. Uh, with a bunch of parents and then um the, then we have our like my wife is uh what do they call it um um chaperoning if you will oh, oh, oh okay <laughs> <laughs> and so so is uh we have uh, another another family that could uh take the um uh you know towards the end of the week and join my wife up there so i had to go up and get everybody situated so I was yeah. gone for 24 hours. I had to just drive up there and made sure the kids went to camp. And well, it okay. was, sure was nice up there. That's for yeah. sure. 
yeah, I know it's going to heat up this weekend. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, we're yeah I love I love Northern mountains. Arizona. There is one advantage of being there. You're yeah. an hour and a half away from the mountains. It's really one of the nicest. Uh, yeah. Well, it's one of the nicer places in in Arizona. But anyway, hey, that's yeah. neither here nor there. I'll I'll let you finish up what you're what you're saying. But I am back. So okay, Blake is back, everyone. So you know, <laughs> I'm I'm still thinking. Uh, I don't know if the dollar is going to try and rally one more time but i sure wish it would get it over with and make new lows and uh you would think that was going to happen with the s p's about to you know make new all-time highs uh the only thing that's a little different picture and not, maybe it's over uh, at least for a correction is we did not confirm all these new highs in crude and this looked like a one two three i pointed out last week um but I'm not that active uh, this week. Last couple of weeks I was and, you know, really trying to just be patient and wait for a break. I don't know if this is enough for me to buy Aussie. Didn't even get to 38% back. So just sitting here um, waiting for trades to come to me. I, I, I hear my uh, brain saying, Dale, just, you know, put something on, uh, look for something to do. And uh, I always have to shut that off, don't you? When you're thinking, I need to do something, I've got to find a trade. And, you know, uh, sometimes you end up finding a trade. So uh, what you want to do when that's happening is, if you didn't plan it, is just walk away. And I, I guarantee this, that there will be a trade that you'll see in the not too distant future. Pays to be patient. So just call me um, Job. For me to be patient for a few days is is a lot of patience. <laughs> for 10 minutes <laughs> is a lot of patience. So uh, are you back in the groove? And what do you make out of the board here, Blake? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I make out the fact that we're still uh, within, you know, 30 points of the 4,200 level. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. either side of it. So we're not going anywhere, but in my opinion, it looks like the market is going to break higher. Now, you, you know, you just mentioned something about, um, about trade selection and about patience. Um, I'm actually not today, but tomorrow I am filming a video um, on uh, the 10 or not the 10, uh, actually the five worst trading traits. And, uh, and, and I think it's, I think this video is going to be really helpful for everyone. Um, I know it's, I, I, I gear it for, you know, those of us that have ever been in a trading slump and believe me, I've been in trading slumps that, that just, it's part of the game. And, um, but one of the ways that you get there is by Impulse you know, trade. showcasing these traits, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. so one of the things that you were just talking about is patience or lack thereof, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna be filming that video, I believe, tomorrow. Um, so you know, you asked me how was I uh how 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 are things or if I'm back in the groove. I mean, I'm I've been I watched the market yesterday, even though I, I climbed up a mountain yesterday as well. Uh I, I still um watch them watch the market. I actually did the um did the uh, 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 analysis at the end of the day um, for the Forex analytics subscribers, because it, I mean, we didn't have any like um, major moves really that happened no. other than Bitcoin. Bitcoin's been. Yeah. It broke down. Uh, I had a line that it took out of that consolidation that it's been in. Yeah. You have it too. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, this, this point, and I, I'm going to, I want to, talk about Bitcoin since it's really the only asset class that's, that's moving at this point. Um, now that's doesn't mean that there aren't other things moving, but this is like probably the big mover. Um, and if you were, um, if you use uh, Forex analytics, just so you guys know, uh, Bitcoin over the weekend, um, I don't know if the, no, this went, um, you know, actually, Blake, when it was over 60, you said, uh, and started to roll over, you said you thought you'd be able to buy it at 20K. And yeah, well, uh, I saw some counts that take it to about 23. 
I, I just want to let everybody know over the weekend when it started to break down, here's the four hour chart when when the when Bitcoin started to break lower below yeah. that thirty five thousand level. Um, you were all notified for the Forex Analytics subscribers. So, you know, even if you're not in front of your computer at that moment, it's uh, you at least get a notification on your mobile app or your, you know, your. Those are lifesavers. Well, the, I, I hope that that, and that's what we hope as, as traders that you guys have, you know, the technology like Forex Analytics on your phone so you can be notified when things are moving. And um, I mean, Bitcoin is breaking down now and that is one of the things that um that that you know signal signals to us that we have to be a little careful here coming out of this this uh this pennant but if the pennant really breaks and we break through the thirty thousand level i mean we are actually now looking to move towards twenty thousand and possibly below i i i'm i don't want to freak anybody who's long bitcoin out but i mean this pennant and and I was talking to uh, I know you guys are gonna laugh about this, but I was talking to my son about this because my okay. son's like, well, you know, this is a fourteen year old kid, right? And he's yeah. he's like he's trading crypto and he's uh, um, he and he doesn't have a margin account, so he just wants to buy crypto. So he's like, well, dad, you know, when crypto gets to uh, gets to twenty thousand, should I buy it there? And you know, this is me having a conversation with my fourteen year old son, by the way. And, uh, and I'm like, well, you know, and he knows he, he, he understands support and resistance. He understands how's it, how, how's it, uh, how that works. And he's like, but you know, that it, it broke out at 20,000. Should I be buying there? I'm like, you know, if you want to buy it there and hang on to it and hope it, hope it bounces there, it should bounce from there. I, I get, I get what you're saying. But the problem is the, the targets actually point towards 10,000. He's like, should I wait for 10,000? I'm like, well, you got to think about all the people that are going to buy it at 20,000 and how many people are going to have sell stops somewhere below 20,000. Um, should we trigger, like if we hit 20,000 and then we start trading, like, let's say like 18,000, you, you know, you, you, you got people that are like, okay, well, I'm willing to buy it at 20 grand, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose more than 10%. Well, 10% is actually $2,000 below 20 grand. 20 grand. So you're, you're talking about 18. Well, think about like all the accelerated selling that could actually take place with people that keep buying the dip, buying the dip, buying the dip. And I mean, could we reach for 10 K? I mean, we could, I mean, yeah. so I think you have to have that in your mind, whether or not we <clears throat> is, are you all right now? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, whether <laughs> or not we get there is, uh, is another thing, but I, I do think that the, the technicals say that we're going there. Um, I'm, I mean, myself, I think you're going to get, we're going to get a tradable bounce at 20,000. Like, like if, if 20,000 might end up being it, if we make our way down here, if we actually break down like this, here, let me fix this really quick. I'm just going to make this a little bit um, wider. So I think if we make it to 20 K I think we'll bounce from here, but then we might eventually break down. You know, I think it's going to be a tradable bounce at 20,000 though. I, I think everybody in their mother's brother's uncle's nephew's monkey is going to be sitting there trying to sitting on the bid at 20 K trying to buy it. So, you know, I might, you know, try it for a bounce. I just don't know if I'm going to stick around or not, but that's how I'm looking at Bitcoin right now, especially if we break through 30,000. I think this is a trap door move here between um, 30,000 and 20,000. Now you guys know, and I, I want to I stop here for a second and just make sure I'm very clear on what I'm going to say next. I lived through the dot-com bubble. I have, and matter of fact, maybe I have to pull them out of my file cabinet, maybe tomorrow or the next day. Let me pull up a couple of, and I'll show you guys, I'll pull up a couple of worthless stock certificates that I own of a quarter million dollars worth of investments I made back in the late 90s. So you guys can understand that I've been through this, all right? So I, I want you guys to all understand that I have lived through the mania. So 
when you look at crypto in the crypto world, I am really confident. Now, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, obviously, but I'm really confident that a lot of these like altcoins and crap coins, I'm not going to use the terminology that everybody uses. They are there. Most of them are going to disappear. They will not exist in, you know, five years time, maybe two years time. Okay. I, I believe in tech, uh, the, 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 you know, blockchain technology. And I think there is going to be use for cryptocurrencies in the future, but I, I see the parallels between now and, and the late nineties dot com boom. I, I, I've watched a lot of companies come and go like, you know, 95% of the internet companies that were started, I would say maybe even 98, 98 to 99% of the internet companies that were started in the late nineties disappeared. They went out of business. Um, yeah. You have your Yahoo's, you have your AOL's, you have your, you know, um, uh, Amazon of the world and Amazon's of course you do. And they went on to rule the world as you can yeah. see. And you know what? Bitcoin and Ethereum may be the next fiat currency or some, as some, you know, 20, 30 years from now, you may be right. But also if you watched stocks like Amazon lose 80% of its value before yeah, it's a $5 stock, Blake. Yeah. Before it eventually became the biggest company in the world that can happen. And, and so when I look at Bitcoin and I look at all these crap coins, I truly believe 99% of them will disappear. I mean, they may not disappear, but it, it, they'll be worth next to nothing. And, and the, the thing is, is it'll be, it'll be, it'll happen probably at the same time when you're seeing like Bitcoin fall and Ethereum fall, you're just going to see all these, like, you know, these, these altcoins just disappear. And, like I said, I've been through it, guys. I've got a quarter million dollars of worthless stock certificates. Well, at least you have wallpaper. What do you get for a worthless altcoin to put yeah, on your wall? Right. Uh, you have uh, wallpaper, buddy. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jotkin Kumar asks, who remembers kpasa.com? I mean, I don't, you know, here's here's the thing. I, I actually... I actually have, a, I, well, I have, I have, it's gone now. I had $100,000 invested in a company called Visitalk. Visitalk was basically Skype before uh -huh. Skype, like five years before Skype, like in the late nineties. And you know, that, you know what it all was, uh, uh, what was the problem with it is uh, it was just, poor leadership, you know, poor, yeah. poor executive team, you know, crappy executive team. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, the, there's a lot of those that kpasa.com. There's a thousand of those thousand of those companies. And there's a thousand of these altcoins that probably will disappear. There will be there will be survivors, I'm sure. And I'm sure crypto and you know, will be the next best thing to slice bread 30 years from now. John Sims says there's 5,500 crypto crypto coins. And, you know, by the time it's all done, John, I would say there's probably going to be 50, not 5,500. He says 55, 61 crypto. Yeah. Cryptos. Yeah. I mean, there'll be, that are listed. be like 50 yeah. left. Like yeah. when it's all said and done, you'll, you'll have your light coins and Ethereum's and whatever. <laughs> Who knows? Dogecoin's such such a big um, such a big name now because of everything else that anybody that owns Dogecoin is going to end up holding on to it forever, even if it goes to 0 0.02 cents again. You know what I mean? Anyway, I I, I'm, I shouldn't be just spending all this time talking about cryptos, but I, I'm just saying that I think that this is doable. And if you don't think that Bitcoin down here to twenty thousand or ten thousand is not possible. I beg to differ. I think it. I think it is all very possible. Now let's um let's spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of these um, some of the you know fiat currencies, uh, some of the uh, you know some of the currencies that you're seeing here. I want to talk a little bit about where stocks are at. So you, this is something that I mentioned during the week ahead video. If you guys are not 
you know, if you guys didn't listen, you know, we're the, the S and P is nearing its highs. I mean, we're, we look like we're going to break out today. Um, I, I think we're going to see 4,300. You can see where we've got a nice bullish wedge. Um, too many people leaning on short. We should probably, you know, do something like that. Uh, you know, whether or not we continue to break out or we just come back into the, this wedge, um, I think is quite doable. You know, we make new highs. This is what happens every time, you, you know, we make new brief new highs like this, then we reverse down. So, you know, brief new highs, you know, crack through the support, get everybody stopped out, then move back up. That that's the, the characteristics of an ascending wedge. So, you know, you trap everybody long, then you stop them all out, then you get everybody short, then it reverses back to new highs. I mean, it's just, that's as frustrating as it is. That's the character. That's a breakout measure to 4430 about the uh, formation. To, of what? Of this wedge? Yeah. I, yeah. I call it an ascending triangle. So, yeah. 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 I call it a bullish wedge, ascending triangle, whatever you want yeah. to call it. I think you got, four, you got three, um, you know, three targets. There's, yeah. that's the secondary target. 44, 30 uh, Initial target would be something like this. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, maybe back up to the trend line. I mean, that, that seems okay. most doable. Like that. But uh, regardless, risk is going to move higher. So, it, and it, I'm not saying it's going to, it looks like it's going to move higher. So uh, what, what will move with it? Well, you got to think that, um, you know, just in the most simplest form, you know, the commodity currencies. Look, Aussie yen or Aussie yen, Aussie dollar, false breakdown on yeah. Friday, right? Yeah. During the non-farm, yeah. we're like, okay, you know, it looks like a, looks like a flag pattern. Remember, this is pre-non-farm. Looks like yeah. a flag pattern. Um, we got to see NFP. NFP came out dollar weekend. So we got the false breakdown. We talked about that. Okay. But now that we got a false breakdown, well, it should lead us back up towards at least, at least back up towards this resistance. So if stocks move higher, Aussie should move to 78 cents at least, right? Kiwi, yeah. same thing. I mean, you know, you got this little false breakdown of this, this, uh, this um, uh, trend line. Yeah, we should head back to 73 cents. So, you know, there, there's simple trades like that. If you, if you really believe, like I do, that stocks are moving higher, then you could trade you could trade the Aussie higher and then look to short it at 78 cents, um, which I, I actually believe the Aussie is eventually going lower. So I think the, you know, for me, the best trade is going to be wait for 78 cents and short some. Or, you know, hey, here's the Kiwi, wait for 73 cents again and short some up there, right? So I think those are like the, the, the better trades. Does that mean that they're going to happen? No, I, I, I plan my trades and then I trade my plan. So I plan my trades and if they work out that way, fantastic. And if they don't, then I'll just, you know, plan something else to do. Um, so anyway. I, June you know, is it, a uh, favorable month for commodity currencies, according to Adam Button. I'm sorry. Seasonal. Today June is, is a June? constructive month, a good month for commodity currencies, according to Adam Button. Um, That's on interesting. Seasonal. You know, considering that it's one of the weaker months uh, for, for risk, um, it, it, you know, it's. It, if well, it's may, maybe uh, the S&Ps get to that count into the month's end. Yeah, uh, maybe. That you have. Yeah. And. Uh, and you know, and the Aussie rallies into that time frame too. It's it is quite possible. So, um, but you know, we'll see how commodities end here because or what commodities do. I I and and you know what it might be a, be a catalyst is we have inflation data on Thursday, the CPI data. That's going to be like the that's going to be a, I believe the market mover for the week for North American trade. Now, um, Steve is not he he'll be, he's not here. He he will hope to be around for um, the the morning, um, edge. the morning edge here in 45 minutes. But I know Stelios is here and I know Stelios probably has some choice words for inflation and precious. <laughs> <metals>. huh. <laughs> no, just kidding. Good morning, Stel. Good morning, everybody. So um, good morning, Stel. Hey, how you doing? So, um, you know, I kind of agree with uh, Blake in terms of risk and how things are going. I, I always said that uh, on Friday, I said, look, after payrolls, 
I think we're just going to continue the way we were before. Uh, so slow grind lower in the dollar, slow, slow grind higher for equities. I don't see what's going to change that yet. Um, obviously, inflation prints can, can move things, but uh, at the moment, the Fed is not in a hurry to do anything. So, uh, you know, I don't see, I don't see what's going to disturb this, um, uh, this trend. Now, we do have the ECB and the Bank of Canada, which is going to be interesting because, remember, the Bank of Canada is tapering and uh, they have their interest rate decision on Thursday, I think. Um, uh, Bank of Canada is actually tomorrow. Tomorrow, ECB tomorrow. Is ECB is Thursday, yes. Yeah. So, you know, we might get some more um, indications out of those. But, you know, for me, unfortunately, nothing's changed. We keep going. Uh, met, you talked about metals. I think they might be, um, you know, prime for a, for a little bit of a dip because we're getting to resistance in... Uh, Look at the S&P, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, everybody's listening to the morning edge right now, or I'm, I'm sorry, the face webinar, <laughs> all the futures traders out there are like, oh crap. You know, Dale said the market's going higher. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, I think metals might, uh, um, correct a little bit. Uh, if you look at, uh, gold, silver and the miners and everything there, they're coming to uh, some resistance, but, uh, uh, you know, you know, my view on these long-term medium term, I, I really like them. Um, Currency wise, very difficult to have an opinion, really difficult. I, I will tend to agree with you uh, regarding commodity currencies, simply because if risk keep going, they're probably going to keep going. Um, but uh, I have very little in currencies at the moment because uh, there's no direction. Uh, yield yeah, is I mean, still what at, that. Look, yep. look at look at as the S&P just moved higher. Um, you know, I mean, look at what the, the Kiwi is doing. The Kiwi just started to break higher. You know, just over the last 10 minutes or so. I mean, it's that's the natural trade, right? For at least for now. Yep, exactly. And uh, I'm still looking at bonds and, uh, you know, yields. Uh, as long as they're not uh, spiking higher, I don't think anything's going to change, uh, uh, change this. Um, yields trend. are pooping the bed right now. Are they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Look at, this is the 10 year. I mean, we're, we're, a... we're, we're, we're breaking lower. So, you know, this move lower in yields, I mean, is, is goosing the market. That's, that's I mean, really right. odd. I, I see 10 year up like 0.2% on the day and the boons up 1%. Oh, sorry, the boons have just rolled. That's why they're, they're up. Yeah, um, we're, we're about five pips from that low 1.48 1, 1. for a breakdown. It's been in a sideways trading range here. Yeah, you know, at what point, and, and still, I know we have just a couple of minutes uh, before Giles comes on, and I, I'm interested to hear what he has to say about um, currencies, because I'm not familiar with Giles, but I was looking at his bio, and he looks like a very interesting uh, interesting guy. So um, I, 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 I guess I really wanted to uh, ask you, like, at what point does the market look at, you know, at, at bonds and yields coming down and say, oh, you know, maybe bonds are going higher for a different reason. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe yeah. bonds are moving higher because people are a little nervous about taking on risk at 4,300 in the S&P or 4,200 in the S&P. Um, at, you know, at what point did they, they bridge that gap and say, wait, wait a second, why are yields actually going down right now? I mean, because right now the market is cheering the fact that yields are going down. Stocks are going to go higher because, you know, because I'm going to get free money forever. I mean, probably till 130, uh, uh, 130 looks like a target on the 10 year 1.3 bips. You think so? Yeah. I mean, that if looks we break down. Yeah. Yeah, it looks doable. I mean, you, you just just uh, just a simple, yeah. you know, simple calculation. And that wouldn't even be. I think that only would be about thirty eight percent back from that whole move. So, anyway, descending triangle. You have it. I had as a rectangle. So you know, yeah, you're, Dale. Dale, spot well on right here yeah. about what it looks like. I mean, that looks very doable. So, Silly, do you have any opinion about that? I mean, I know we only have a minute. But. Uh... It's a correction. It's a correction. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know. The, <laughs> the question is, what do people say if it starts dropping? You know, it's a, you know, the question is, why will yields drop? You know, is are people panicking and going to safe haven um, assets? Is the Fed just going to stay, you know, stay on the accelerator and just keep buying everything? Uh, I don't know. It, it will depend on the reason why. Stagflation. Uh, couple of weak economic numbers people are extrapolating into the future 
Woo woo yeah. stagflation. Nothing like yeah. higher inflation and no growth. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yummy, yummy. <laughs> Why what am a... I the Elon Musk of face? I, I, I don't I, want anonymous on my ass. <laughs> no, I that was kind of crazy. Place. Wasn't that over the weekend? That was kind of You know crazy. what's interesting about it, and we'll get to Giles, um, yeah. is if you look at Tesla, they it's a big descending triangle, and it's holding a breakdown. Measures to about 250, 350 if you pull up Tesla. Like, you see that? All right, big descending triangle. And so I'm thinking anonymous has uh, Puts. a technician on board. <laughs> that sees that Elon might be vulnerable if we break down. That's well, a canary in the coal mine. I think could, that chart right be. there. You know what's even what's even crazier is I is uh, our my kids. We watched V for Vendetta like two oh. weeks ago, like a week yeah, and a half ago. Yeah. It was like crazy. Yeah. Um, hey, just really quick, guys, before uh, uh, Dale takes over, um, if you want to learn how to join the Forex Analytics family for free possibly for a few months, um, open a Pepperstone live trading account. And if you use this link right here, you can open an account and get two months free when you open an account up to two more months, depending on how much trading you do. Uh, I think you have to trade, was it 50,000 in currency? Steve knows the-, the What's that, a five lot? Yeah, like a five lot of- Yeah, uh, five or No, lots, it's, yeah. is it 500,000 in currency? I th uh, it's five standard lots, which I think is 500,000, right? In yeah, and, yeah, anyway. Uh, and, and somebody asked what the trade balance. Uh, oh, we had trade balance data. Oh, who, who cares okay. about trade? I'm not looking at trade. You looking at trade? I'm not it looking at trade. It hasn't mattered for a while. I could, I could care less it's, about for that. For like 20, um, like for my whole career. <laughs> hey, no, trade balance did matter when, when you were dealing with the China, you know. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, that, that issue. Anyway. But you guys have to visit our webinar sponsors if you continue to like these free webinars, right? And uh, if you live in the US or Canada, uh, make sure you visit Forest Park FX. You, you guys heard Justin on our webinar, what is it, a week and a half ago? It was a great, great webinar interview that you did with him, Dale, because that was very eye-opening for a lot of people, I'm sure. Oh, um, all right, I'm gonna let you take over. And, and for those of you that are part of the Forex Analytics family, we'll see you on the morning edge webinar in 45 minutes okay blake good hunting thank you, blake. thanks good guys. to have you back thanks nice to be back not really it's too hot here, i know thank you all right <laughs> hi giles welcome hey, to face dale great to be here really looking forward to being with you and really enjoyed the webinar so far uh, uh it's a pleasure to meet you giles and thanks, uh, dale. all right you have you used zoom before Yes, I have. Who, had, who hasn't used Zoom, right? So yeah, I see. You, yeah. you could go ahead and share your screen. So you should see something now. How's that okay, looking? We got it. So yeah. you know, I like to do this at the beginning, Giles. You know, uh, uh, obviously, um, you're a veteran. You're a pro. Uh, by your, uh, tell me if I have your title correct. Head currency strategist at GCFX. Yeah, that's right, though. Okay, um, but you know what? We all had origins and we all had a genesis we all had a beginning and you know i think a lot of people underestimate um how long it really takes to become yeah. proficient at being a trader so i'm curious yeah. how you broke into the business uh, i mean did you always know you wanted to be in the markets or was you know, it by chance or what happened Dale, it was completely by chance i had been putting off speaking to a pensions advisor for, for quite a few years. And eventually I was at a conference with my work and I was working as in a uh, city mission in Birmingham. And I went to this conference and a pensions advisor was telling us how to save for a pension. Now, as, as you know, Dale, particularly in the UK, if you're, work, if you're working as a sort of a, a community um, missions worker in the city, you, you tend to have very low salaries. So I knew that I needed a pension at some stage, uh, but the pensions advisor, what he was telling me was so difficult to achieve that I just thought I sat and I started thinking to myself and I remembered as a child, the different exchange rates between the pound and the dollar, you'd have it read out every night on the BBC huh. news. It, you'd always say, you know, one pound buys you so-and-so dollars, right. so the pounds up or down against the dollar. And so yeah. I stuck my hand up, Dale, and said to the fella, I said, excuse me, Mr. Pensions Advisor, says, 
But if I put all my money into dollars when the exchange rate was favorable and then exchanged all my dollars back into pounds when the exchange rate was in my favor the other way, I said, would that be a way of increasing my pension pot um, over a number of years? And what he said to me, Dale, was what was he planted a seed in my in my mind because he didn't say, yes, you could do it. He didn't say, no, you couldn't do it. What he said, he says, well, then you'd be doing what I'm doing. Huh. And he didn't explain any more than that because it, it wasn't part of the uh, conference. He was particularly to do with pensions. And that got me thinking. And then um, I looked into exchanging currencies. And that's when I came across the Forex market. And I suddenly realized that what had been my sort of idea that I thought I was, you know, cleverly thinking up for myself <laughs> you yeah you thought it was a, an original thought uh, what, what i thought currency. was the original thought was <laughs> yeah you know genuinely yeah. a billion actually, uh, then a billion yeah. other people <laughs> Del, do you know what i mean it was actually, yeah, it's great you know yeah. it was actually the world's largest market and i had a bit of an <laughs> aha moment like yeah. you know okay i've been a bit slow on the uptake um yeah. but that was the seed that got me interested okay. in the forex market and then that started the journey and that was about in 2008 2009 okay great time to start during the debacle <laughs> so, so uh, it's not a great it wasn't a great time to learn yeah, well yeah but uh you know really sometimes yeah. the best time to learn is when there's the most pain out there yes. so uh you yeah. decided to do this and then you you probably went online and you saw the different ways you could trade currency um did you have any mentors when it came to trading or any books that influenced you giles uh, yeah that, you know, opened your eyes to uh, probably what you're doing today. Yeah. So the journey that I took was probably like most traders. I thought there must be a way of cracking the technical analysis of charts. There must be some secret formula. There must be some secret pattern that if I just do enough back testing, I'll eventually find a technical pattern. So right. my first sort of three, four years were spent rigorously back testing, looking at charts, looking at patterns. Yeah. And I was successful trading purely technicals because I came quite I became quite good at technical analysis. But but what happened was I became increasingly insecure, Dale, because what I'd realized is thought, well, I I I know that I've kind of got away with, an, with another trade by the skin of my teeth, you know, stopping, yeah. reversing, going the other way through high volatile news events. Um, but I had this deep insecurity, which is I don't really know what I'm doing. And, and, and that'll sound a silly thing, but because I didn't understand why the financial markets were moving, it meant that I never felt secure, even with the success that I was having because it, it, it was very random. And at times I was using too much leverage. Okay. So, you know, you, you'd suddenly see a, a bit of a momentum play and enter with high leverage and, and, and you'd be ahead of the game. Um, so that kind of uh, way of trading was very unsettling. And the adrenaline that it gave you was very um, unsettling as well. It wasn't, it wasn't long-term sustainable. And then I started to understand trading from a, a macro uh, position. So understanding central bank policy, understanding intermarket analysis, risk on, risk off, how the bond markets affects currency markets, how the commodity markets affect, expect, affect currency right. markets. Right. You, you know, started to learn about relationships and yeah, correlations and, and central banks being such a big part. Let me ask you this. Uh, yeah. Do you take positions in front of central banks like we have the ECB coming up this week uh, or, you know, may, any central bank or a big number like NFP here in the mm -hmm. States is a big number. Um, mm -hmm. Do you trade through red events? Oh, yeah, absolutely, uh, you do. Dale. But the difference now is that I'm trading with knowledge. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trading understanding. So here's a trade that I took. Now, this is part of my role as HYCM's chief currency analyst. Yeah, yeah but I, I went to your blog. Very nice blog that you have. Yeah, thank you, um, Dale. And this was an example. I bring it up because... This was uh, Euro New Zealand dollar sellers expected into the ECB rate meeting on Thursday. So okay. 
this was a trade that I took on my personal account from last Friday. Okay. So I was expect, you know, basically there's been a shift by, by the ECB that they are expected to um, be much more on hold now. So they were expected to maybe taper bond purchases. Now it isn't expected. So on Friday, I was selling the Euro New Zealand dollar. I took half a clip off yesterday and I've got another clip at break even just trying to ride through a potentially bearish ECB meeting. Now I think it, it the, um, it's it's on in the balance what happens with the ECB meeting. In fact, is it worth covering now? Because I had I've got something yeah. on it, Dale. Yeah, go ahead. So you're expecting some type of bearish outcome, a low well, euro. I, well, what go I was ahead. doing is I was anticipating bearish expectations into the right. meeting, and okay. then at the meeting, I'm seeing potentially a different picture. But I'm positioned for selling. But I'll I'll, I'll go through my rationale. It will make sense. Uh, okay, there with what I'm looking at. So basically, going into the ECB rate meeting, 80% of Bloomberg economists see the PET program remain unchanged. Okay, So we had ECB's chair Schnabel um, saying that premature removal of ECB support would be a great mistake. We also had Christine Lagarde saying now it's the wrong time to remove uh, PEP, the PEP program. We also had the hawkish members. They were making quite quite restrained comments, Dale, if you know what I mean. They weren't okay. being as bullish as normal. So looking into it, if you went back three weeks ago, everyone was saying, oh, the June is when the ECB are going to taper their bond purchases. That's a big debate going across the whole globe with different central banks. With I think Canada so far is the only one, or, uh, or New Zealand did. Yeah, Bank of Canada did. RBNZ, they brought their interest rate hikes forward to 2022. They okay. see their first one in 2022. They have okay. also started reducing their QE purchases this week. And okay. if you take a look at the New Zealand 10-year bond yield chart, you see we've had this nice rise higher in the Aussie, in the Aussie New Zealand 10-year, rather. Okay. And there was a little bit of a divergence um, uh, you see here, the, here's the uh, New Zealand 10 years. See, it's pushing higher up to that's 1.9 yield percentage. And there was a bit of a divergence coming out between the Aussie New Zealand dollar pair. Um, and I'll show that. This is another trade that I'm currently in here. Um, I was, I've shorted this from 1.700 because there's a bit by divergence with the RBNZ signaling an exit to easy monetary policy, right. but the RBA haven't quite yet. And I noticed right. that Josh Freinberg, who's the, um, the treasurer for um, Australia, he's been talking about trying to get unemployment down to 4%, Dale. Now, it's currently at 5.5%. So that tells me that if he wants to see unemployment down to 4%, that hasn't, the Australia hasn't seen that level since about the 1970s. So it tells me they're quite happy to keep interest rates unchanged. They're going to be quite supportive for some time. And if you check out the bond yield spread between the Aussie and New Zealand dollar um, uh, bond yield spread, you see it's dipping lower? Yeah. So I'm expecting a little bit of weakness here in the Aussie New Zealand dollar. I have been surprised about this strength, but you can just see, see here there's consolidation. You've got Harami inside bar pattern, inside bar, a little bit of consolidation against that key trend line. So technically, uh, I'm not worried about that. And fundamentally, I still see a downside in the Aussie New Zealand dollar. But in, anyway, okay. so I, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting excited. Okay. Uh, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, um, so, uh, you know... Um can't find a dollar bull anywhere, right? I mean, you know, most of the sentiment indicators have about 20% they dollar bulls. And that's off. It doesn't make, full, doesn't and make sense to me. for a while. So uh, I, I'm wondering what your take is on the, you know, global the, reserve currency. Yeah, yeah. If there's any hope for, a, you know, I still think we'll take out the January low. Yeah. Um, but do you think uh, that we're, Instead of being close to a dollar crash, we're close to terminating this decline in the dollar. Right. I'll tell you where I'm with this. I get asked by this by journalists quite a lot. So I do uh, t Reuters. Well, I was a journalism major in college. So well, there, Dale. Uh, you know, here you go. So Look, you know, well, this is why you're asking the good question. So I get asked this question a lot. I'll tell you how I'm approaching it from a trader's perspective. Okay. I've heard both sides of the story. The medium term dollar bearish picture makes sense to me. 
Uh, okay. The short-term dollar strength picture also makes sense to me. So I can see decent arguments on both sides. Now, yeah. I think it's going to come down to cat and mouse over the inflation story. So if inflation keeps rising higher, the expectations of the Federal Reserve tapering bond purchase is going to rise. So do you remember the good ADP jobs data we had last Wednesday? Yeah. That, that got every, you know, all the animal spirits were out. Right, we saw the right. break of this trend line. We're going to have right. a million jobs on Friday. You know, woohoo, yeah. Fed tapering, the, the usual kind of intraday right. enthusiasm that fades as soon as we get a jobs report. Now, the jobs report, Bloomberg was saying it's like the Goldilocks number. They were saying it was perfect for stocks because it was... It wasn't yeah. enough of a miss. Not too hard, not too Yeah, cold. yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, everyone's happy with that outcome. So we now see the dollar just sat on this uh, trend line waiting for Thursday's CPI data. And we're just going to okay. p- keep playing cat and mouse, Dale. It's going to be okay. cat and mouse from data point to data point until we get the shift. So as a trader... What I'm doing is I'm playing, I'm playing cat and mouse with it. So when we had the disappointing jobs, I saw that you played that um, Aussie US dollar false break on the commodity-based currency on the week yeah. NFT. Well, yeah. I was on the New Zealand US dollar. So we were, okay. we, we were covering both sides of that, uh, Cherry. And I just saw it fell into that nice support area. And then price was right down this level. I remember we had the RBNZ, they'd done that bullish shift with the central right. bank policy. Yeah. So I knew yeah. I was bullish New Zealand dollar, bullish because they're a commodity based currency. And then as soon as we had the weak NFP data, it was just a, a straightforward buy. But I, but I closed out on Friday, Dale, because I didn't think the sentiment was going to necessarily last. And I'll show you why. Because if you look at the sentiment recently that we've had, now the 12th of May, that was the big, the last CPI print that we had of the US. And yes. that got animal spirits running. We then had the PPI data the next day. It was strong, but it wasn't above maximum expectations. So look what happened to the dollar? Sold off. We had PCE data a week last Friday, which was strong, but it wasn't above maximum expectations. So what happened? The dollar sold off. We had the jobs data. It came in below expectations, but as you said, not too hot, not too cold. And what happened? The dollar sold off. So each time we're seeing dollar sellers, because I think the sage heads there are saying, well, look, the Fed have said they're going to look through inflation. They're not going to be wanting to risk the recovery by moving too fast, too quickly. So I think we're going to continue to see this game of cat and mouse until something breaks. So if inflation spikes higher, I'd expect dollar strength. And then potentially dollar sellers stepping in. And I just think we're going to keep going through this cycle until we really get um, some clear narrative. Um, Because at the moment, I don't think the narrative is clear because we keep getting um, a little bit of alarmist reaction. And if you look what from May the 7th through to June the 7th, I'd say that's a pretty flat range. range. 100 points. And I think the market is just saying, we don't actually know what to do. And that right. makes sense to me because the, sh- the, sh- the, the medium term weakness, reflation trade out of the US makes sense to me. But the short term US dollar, a little bit of strength, a little bit of retracement also makes sense to me. But I'll tell you one pair I'm interested in, which I think we can benefit from all this, is the dollar CAD. Now, tomorrow okay. we've We've got the Bank of Canada rate meeting, and I think there's a lot of potential here, and I'll just run you through what I'm looking for. Uh, The Bank of Canada, remember the April 21st meeting when they uh, tapered bond purchases? And if you remember going into the event, do you remember how everyone was saying, look, Canada's gone into a lockdown. I I bet the Bank of Canada won't taper. And and I remember people were going with that breakout because it was a decent breakout. I I had a go going with it myself because I was following that narrative. Then the, the rate meeting came out, and all of a sudden, they tapered bond purchases from four billion Canadian dollars per week to three billion dollars uh, per week. Now we've had two jobs reports out from Canada, and both of them have been weak, but job postings are still strong. So the outlook for Canada is not as bad as perhaps the two weak jobs data's uh, prints communicate, because. 
job postings are high. And the reason jobs have been weak is because of the COVID-19 uh, restrictions that have come back into Canada. So what I'm looking at is if I see a more dovish Bank of Canada, I think there's a good opportunity for either US dollar CAD upside or Australian dollar CAD upside. Because look how the CAD strengthened. And Governor yeah. Macklem, when price was down here, Governor Macklem said, you know, he was concerned about the strength of the Canadian dollar. So already that tells me the governor's concerned about the strength of the Canadian dollar. I have that same line. It's actually a throwover under a channel. There's another yeah. channel. If you yep. extend the line to the left, yep. it was a wedge. And um, so I can see what you're looking at if we... Um, take out the upper side of it, we should have some type of bear, uh, at least bear market rally. I, I'm yeah. looking for a bottom there too. I just think that uh, it may not, you know, it may just be short lived. Um, yeah. Because, yes. because I think there's a shot for the Aussie to trade at 81 before this dollar decline is over. So I, it yeah. makes it hard for me to want to be a uh, position uh, trader on the long side of Canada yet, maybe 118. But yeah. um, anyway, uh, that's a great looking formation. So uh, you're going to you're going to be long into that event. Well, no, because I'm not going to be long into the event because I think that's too much of a 50 50. So I'll tell you the yeah. way I'm playing it is if I got a retest back down to this channel, okay. down to the bottom of this wedge yeah. here, I would play along from there because Ahead of the BOC, is the range going to break out? You know, almost right. certainly not. So I would feel confident buying at about 1.2030. Otherwise, what I'm looking at here is a very interesting setup. Now, I'll tell you the way, one of the sort of my styles, Dale, is that I found taking simple trend line breaks on macro shifts to be very effective. So if I get a dovish BOC, that would be the macro shift. And this is the near term trend line. Now, this also betrays another technical setup, which you, if you look on the weekly chart, you'll see there's a lovely false break of a Harami inside bar pattern, which should just pop up in the middle. Uh, right. And you see here, you've got Harami inside bar, and then you had a false break of the Harami inside bar pattern on the 31st of May. So that false break um, can be powerful. And if we get a break above that Harami uh, false break bar, that 1.2140 region, yes. you'd expect, you know, you'd expect a test up to 1.2250 if it's on a macro reason. Okay. So it's not that I'm just trading the technicals here. I'm looking for the macro reason. So that would mean if I'm at the event, I get anything dovish from the boc that i think is likely to last more than you know two or three sessions that i'm going long from market because anywhere below 1.2140 is good value for me okay and All then right. the way the way i manage the trade is i'll go long here and then this trend line becomes critical for me as long as price is above i'm not worried about the trade if price gets back below down that trend line on a daily closing basis, I'm asking more serious questions. So a bit like with my RBNZ, Aust with my Aussie uh, New Zealand dollar short. So the way I'm playing this here is technically price is below that trend line. So I'm not, I'm not yeah. worried about the trade. I looked at the macro fundamentals still in play. But if price goes back above here, then I'm asking questions, Dale. Yes. And I might bring my stops down. Sometimes I might close the trade and consider re-entering when it goes back into my direction. But what I found is using those trend lines can be very nice. helpful just for cutting those losses short. Yeah. And if necessary, re-entering. What I hate is being in drawdown for hundreds and hundreds of points, which is one of the which is one of the tricky sides of, of, of macro trading is, you, you, you know, you, you might have a fundamental bias for something, but you still have the same bias, whether it's 200 points lower or 300 points lower. You know, Jack Schwager says the same thing when I asked him that question about, uh, he actually wrote about it in the complete guide to futures trading, Right. that uh, the problem with fundamentalists is they don't have risk management that, you know, fundamentally, if something looks good and, 
you've bought it at higher levels and it gets cheaper it looks even better does it, it doesn't make up. sense to me Dale. it, it yeah. just doesn't make sense to me because um i had a trade last year and i went down into like seven or eight percent drawdown and yeah. i was convinced of the trade but it was my it ended up being a profitable trade but when i had that experience um, I decided that I was not going to let that happen again because I had six weeks of misery. Let me ask you this and uh, something, you know, they call me coach. Something that I've noticed my, myself is that when you're stuck in a bad position and you're waiting for it to, um, you know, get some relief on the position, yeah. that there's so much opportunity cost because you're more risk averse until you get out of the mess. And, 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 uh, trading opportunity after trading opportunity will pass you by because you're stuck in a loser. Well, coach, you can see why they give you the title coach. Exa exactly. And, and, and it affects your psychology. Um, I'll tell you a good book I read on this that helped me. Now, it's not a good book for macro trading, but I, I don't think the author intended it for that purpose. But for risk management, it's brilliant. And it's Peter Brainerd's, his uh, professional diary of a commodity trader oh like okay. his risk management is first class and he pretty much says in the book like the reason i'm successful is because of my risk management and what he does dale is he use classical chart patterns right. now i love classical chart patterns i you know head and shoulders and McGee, yeah. oh i just i just love yeah. them i just love the the artistry of it and in my um uh, on my blog i've got a whole I've got loads and loads of them. Um, I'll just show you here. Let me show you. It's, and it's you know what else you have? Um, and it comes across in your voice. You have a lot of enthusiasm for what you do. And uh, you could tell that you're, you know, enthusiastic I, I, about uh, uh, the book. Uh, Hardy is a professional diary of a commodity trader. Is that it, Giles? Yeah. Yeah. So, and here's... Yeah, that's it. It's Peter Brennard. Um, and this, you see here, trading head and shoulders pattern, there's continuation patterns, how to trade symmetrical triangle patterns. Yeah. A and this fella, he uses the um, classical chart patterns like this, and he's got a risk management profile that he uses to trade them with, um, which okay. is very good. And in you, have the a book, view on the, you have a view on the end. No one could figure that out right now. I mean, it's, it was trading with yields. Uh, uh, oh, what's this? Uh, it? Dollar yen. Right. Yeah. Um, dollar yen. Yeah. Med I, I think me I'm medium term bullish dollar yen. And you're right. It's the US 10 year yields. Yeah. And you can see a little bit of a, a divergence going on here. Right. right. Dollar yen holding up. But if you just look technically, that makes sense to me, Dale. Okay. It's, it's holding the trend line. You've got yeah, Harami by, inside bar pattern. By probably its waiting by its fingernails. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably waiting for um the Thursday CB. CPI. Oh, that too. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, Giles, uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. You know what happens to guests that survive an interview with me? You know what ha <laughs> what is bestowed upon you? Tell me, Coach. I'm looking forward to yeah, this. Yeah, you're now my trading warrior, brother. Oh, Dale, thank you very much. I'll be How putting up. The... I'll be putting it up on Twitter straight away. <laughs> I'm now your, your your trading warrior at, at, at Giles Cochran CCA. Yeah, and uh, the best way for people to find you, Giles, is uh, on Twitter using at your name, Giles Coughlin. Coughlin and, CCA. And uh, and they could go to your blog. Is uh, what's the address on that? Uh, the address on that is blog.hycmlab.com. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to have you back. What do you think? For me, I would love to be back. I just, I've loved it, Dale. It's, it, okay. What I like is talking to other people who are enthusiastic about the markets, sharing knowledge, sharpening each other. Um, and it's been an honor and a privilege to be here today, Dale. Thank you for your invitation. You know, I'm, I'm really glad that our paths crossed, Giles. Thank you so much for your time. That's our most valuable currency. And uh, good hunting to you through the ECB. And um, yeah. I'll, give you, I'll shoot you a message on Twitter, and we'll find another date uh, this fall. Okay, that is great, Dale. Thank you, for, thank you all very much. Thank you for having me. All right, Giles Coughlin, everybody. And... Uh, 
head currency strategist at GCFX, and you can find him on Twitter at Giles Coughlin, G-I-L-E-S-C-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Adios, everyone. Good luck on the rest of your turnaround Tuesday. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. I'll see you, Ingmar. Uh, a lot of people are thanking you, Giles, and uh, good luck to you guys, too. It's not luck. It's hard work and living through adversity. If that scares you, do something else. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll see everyone later. Take it easy, Giles. Thanks, Dale. Bye. Bye-bye.